Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Little. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Today we have a very interesting final table to review from you. This was played on GG Poker. This is a World Series of Poker final table featuring Kristen Bicknell. She is one of the best poker players in the world and I'm excited to see how this plays out. This was a six-handed table, well, tournament as you can see here, but apparently at the final table they combined down to nine. So that's interesting, but it is what it is. Um, you can see the current chip stacks. You see Kristen way down there at the bottom with 15 big blinds, but hey, anything can happen. In this tournament, first place is $356,000. It's a lot of buy-ins, goodness gracious. This event attracted um, 892 players, so a very, very big tournament. Second place is 216 all the way down to ninth place, which is 29,000. Now, 29,000 may sound like a lot of money, but you're trying to win the World Series of Poker bracelet. All right, let's get right to it. I'm just gonna watch this entire hand history, okay? I'm gonna try to not get bogged down. If you've seen my previous um, World Series of Poker final table review, we got a little bit bogged down going through various ICM spots, really drilling down on that. If you want more of that type of content, check out my training site, pokercoaching.com. We have lots and lots of content like that there explaining scenarios like that. Here we have under the gun raising and then ace queen in the hijack seat decides to go all in. This is only a 10 big blind stack, right? Whenever you are last in chips, as you see right here, you're probably going to be the next person out anyway, if you just like sit here and blind out. So whenever that's the case, you would kind of just have to push it to some extent. The only time you'd want to be very tight as the shortest stack is when the other Short stacks are very similar stack. You like say we have a 10 big blind stack here and then there's two 12 big blind stacks and they're all basically very short. And also when they are really getting in there and battling against each other, which maybe they are, maybe they aren't. You have to figure that out. In general though, you're not looking to fold good hands like ace queen suited, even against an under the gun raise, even knowing you're gonna get called a decent amount of the time. This is one of the bigger stacks. So perhaps this bigger stack is incentivized to open a little bit wide. It does have to worry about... Um, Bellarmino here with the chip lead, which is always kind of rough to raise into, but I think you just have to, you have to get in with the ace-queen suited. And when you're ace of two big blinds and get jammed on and you have ace-queen suited, you're just all in. I mean, like you have, you have to call it off with the sixes. There we go. Getting all confused. There's so much information going around here. When you raise to two big blinds and get jammed on for 10, you just have to call it off with any pair due to your pot odds, even in final table scenarios, even if it's for all your chips to some extent. All right, I imagine it's gonna fold around to Kristen. She's may or may not open this, depending on how it goes. She may just rip it in. She does fold though, and I think that's fine. It's worth mentioning, whenever you're approaching, observing a high stakes final table, you have to presume these players are very, very good, right? So don't be like overly critical thinking, oh, these players are bad because I would have done this differently. Don't think that. You need to observe that these players are playing a high stakes tournament. They've made a deep run. Of course, they could be not very good at poker, but they're probably pretty good at poker. And when you take someone like Kristen, for example, she is literally world-class at poker. So you should probably assume whatever she does is correct. There she just essentially rips it in with the queens, which I think is fine. Min raising's fine too. You may ask, do you want to have much of a min raising range there? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's tough to know. It's tough to know. Whenever you're at the final table with two shallow stacks, like we're looking at here where uh, Kristen and Paul both have about 15 big blinds, you really don't want to find yourself all in. So open ripping it will result in hands like that ace-10 suited folding. You may say, do you really want ace-10 suited to fold? I think you would be okay getting it in in that scenario, which is why like if I was playing that spot, I probably would have been raised. But what she did is clearly fine. Notice four big blind raise from Bellarmino from the small blind. That's a nice power play to lean on the medium stack. Imagine he's, I mean, I would probably just open it up with this hand too. I know 6-4 is awful. <laughs> but if you raise here, Paul has to be at least somewhat snug. Now, if you did raise a 6-4 offsuit there, Paul would just rip it in with his um, ace-9 of hearts and you would fold. But you should look to be pretty aggressive when there are two shallow stacks at the final table who are kind of battling for... 8th and 7th, because 7th uh, place is 55,000, 8th is 40,000, so there is a substantial difference in payouts here. 
King Queen raises, Ace two defends, which I think is great. And now this is sort of like a reluctant check call down for Kristen if she faces multiple bets from Isla. I like the small continuation bet on the flop from the King Queen. You don't need to bet big. If your opponent has nothing, they're gonna fold to any bet. And if they have a pair, they're just never folding to any bet. Now you have to ask, am I trying to triple barrel off here? If the turn's not a queen, I think the answer is maybe, because um, clearly the early position raiser has all sorts of good big cards in the range, whereas the big blind caller does not, which means the big the big blind caller probably does have ace king, ace queen, ace jack, etc., because those may rip it in preflop, whereas the, the initial raiser would all have all of those in their range. But when you get a queen on the turn, you have a very clear marginal made hand, and that's going to allow you to check. Kristen goes for thin value on the river. It's always a dicey spot if you get raised. Betting small for thin value on the river is particularly strong against players who are kind of straightforward, but every once in a while you find yourself in a nasty spot when you bet the river and get raised. Notice the king-queen didn't even pay in that scenario. Did the queen king-queen pay? I don't know. It went it went quickly. We've got to pay attention. Fast software here. Unless you're sweating out the river card, then, then it takes forever. All right. So in this scenario, notice Simon has the king 10 offsuit. You could raise here, but I would basically always fold because you have these two shallow stacks that can jam on you and you have the big stack on your direct left. So that's not a spot where you want to raise the king 10 offsuit. By the way, if this is going quickly, pause it. Take your time. We have all the time in the world here. This is going to be a multi-part video. This is a very long hand history. Hopefully that's okay with you. So King-10 offsuit off the 20 big blind stack for Kristen now. Again, I think you can go either way between min-raise or um, fold. I don't think you have to play the hand. I probably would raise it, but folding's fine. I don't think you want to just rip it in because whenever you do run into a better hand, they're mostly going to call, and that's going to be very, very bad for you. Kristen does go for the min-raise, which I think is ideal. Obviously, Patrick's going to 3-bat, and then Kristen will just fold. I don't think you need to go 373 here. I think you want to go a little bit smaller to give your opponent plenty of room to jam. When you make it 373, what's going to happen is you, you somewhat said to some extent that you're putting in a lot of your chips, right? You're giving your you're not giving yourself really great odds to fold if you do get jammed on. I think you'd much prefer to go smaller so that you give the illusion of fold equity. And also that just risks less whenever you are bluffing. Um, that said, I mean, three times the min raise is never like bad or anything. I think you could probably do slightly better going a little bit smaller, like 330. I think you're gonna have roughly the same amount of fold equity and, and that just makes your bluffs cheaper. And you do want to bluff there sometimes, especially with, like ace X. Oh boy. Bellarmino opens up with the ace king. Kristen gets kings. I mean, you can really go any, any direction here between calling, three betting, or jamming. I think Gosh, what do I do? This uh, big stack has actually been kind of snug so far. To be fair, he's had bad hands. Not that we can know that. But I think I'd probably just put it in because when the early position raiser opens, even as the big stack, they're going to have a pretty strong range. Uh, you don't really want to slow play with hands like queens and jacks preflop. Kings is starting to get borderline, but at the final table, especially when there is a shallow stack, you'd rather just get it all in immediately and, and go from there. Kristen does basically put it all in. Obviously, she calls. Ace on the flop. What do we have on the river? We get to sweat it out together for fun. River is a five. Chop it up. <laughs> Dong over here having a party. <laughs> oh, goodness. So king, queen offsuit in this scenario probably wants to min raise. King nine suited very likely should 3-bet this. Notice here he does go to a smaller 3-bet size. It makes his bluffs cheaper when he gets 4-bet. I like this 3-bet size. And notice what's going to happen here is very often if both players miss the flop, Isla's, Aya's going to... How you say this? Isla? Aya? Going to butcher this name. He's going to check. Dong's going to bet. And then Dong's going to win the pot the vast majority of the time unless the king-queen connects with a pair. Well, maybe he won't win on this board. We'll see. This is a spot where you got to think one bet is going to call you, or someone's, you're going to get called for one bet very frequently in this scenario. Dong uses a relatively big size, though. I think it's fine, but notice even then, King Queen does have to stick around because it has a gut shot, and King Queen very easily could be good. Mm 
Does the King-9 fire again? I don't think it needs to. I mean, at this point, yeah, you could be against a 10 that could fold or pocket jacks or something like that that will fold, but you just have the best hand a decent amount of the time when your opponent does have the random over cards or like pocket eights that decided to float. I like the bluff from the King-Queen here. I think that's really your only reasonable option. If you are going to bluff, you need to bet pretty big. You're trying to get a 10 to fold, right? Or pocket kings to fold. The tough thing about this is that if Dong checks back with a lot of ace X on the turn, you're just going to get snapped off a lot. But if he's always betting the ace X on the turn, then this bluff is way, way better, right? Assuming he's not just going to like hero call the nine. If he recalls with a nine, then clearly bluff's not great against this particular opponent in this particular scenario. Tough thing is, is you very rarely know how your opponents are going to play. If you've been watching me stream, you know that I enjoy triple barreling a lot, and uh, sometimes they call in nothing. <laughs> usually, though, they find good folds. Well, good folds. Not good against me, but usually they find big folds. Sometimes they don't, though. When they don't, it fails, and that's okay. I think this king-nine is probably just a fold, though, on average. If you think about what bluffs could Isla have, it's, it has to be, just be like king-queen, which may not even bluff, king-jack, which may not bluff, and queen-jack, which may not bluff. And you have to think the small pairs would also not bluff if they if they are even in the range. Let's fast forward through this break. All right, we're back. King-jack suited, probably just rips it in, I imagine. And this king-jack offsuit will fold, and this ace-two suited will fold. You cannot call a lens with ace-two suited. Very surprised to see this min-raise. This opens the door for you to get jammed on, and then you have to fold, which would be really, really bad. And this hand always has a lot of equity when you... Um, when you just open right, when you just open shove it, right? Like right here, if he just shoves, this ace two suited folds and you win the pot. Um, Chris didn't have king jack offsuit here. I think shoving that would also be very viable. Snap folded it though. Probably thought the min raise range is very strong in this scenario from Paul, which it certainly could be. But uh, I, I think it's okay to just rip it in. I'm kind of surprised you just didn't rip it in. I think you probably want to min raise a much more polarized range in this scenario of aces, like just the best hands and then some bluffs. And then you want to jam the hands that have good equity, and this hand certainly has good equity. Like small pairs or another hand you would want to jam, because you don't want to raise fours and then get jammed on and then have to fold, right? He does like to call it off, though, and it's pretty brutal calling it off flipping. But it's the spot you find it in. Notice if he just rips it in preflop, he avoids the flip. Ace-2 suited does not win. Um, so that ace-2 of spades, I think... Like, look, kind of like how Kristen folded the king-jack offsuit there, I would be pretty cautious against Paul's min-raise preflop in that scenario. Um, I suppose if you think his range is mostly garbage, then jamming's clearly great, but it's hard to know his range is mostly garbage. So I, I definitely think calling preflop is viable for this ace-two of spades. I don't think you just have to rip it in because you're the big stack and you can apply ICM pressure. If you're not familiar with ICM, go back and watch the... Previous World Series of Poker review I did for GG here on my YouTube channel. We go through and discuss ICMizer a lot. One of the problems with ICMizer, though, is that it doesn't tell you when calling is a better play than shoving, because sometimes it is, and it's hard to figure that out. It's part of the skill required to get good at poker, is figuring out the best option between multiple options, right? Because obviously shoving's profitable, I, th I think shoving's profitable, but is it the most profitable play? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So we have only one short stack now, Kristen with 15 big blinds. Looks like this is a very slow structured tournament. So that could be good or bad depending on uh, how long you want to be sitting here. Notice that the blind level goes up after some number of hands, which is kind of neat. All right, so here we have a raise and just flat. Dong does not need to three bet. This is a very important scenario to consider, by the way, preflop, because if you three bet the ace 10 suited, sometimes you can get jammed on or four bet and you have to fold. And you really are not trying to fold out hands like this that have very good equity. So you'd much prefer to just call, see the flop, and, and go from there, especially with the big suited cards. Um, perhaps if we were playing a cash game, you could just justify three betting this because it's very likely ahead of the button's range. But whenever there are payout implications, you really, really, really don't want to be playing big pots in marginal scenarios, and that's what this ace 10 suited is. It's a fine scenario, but you don't want to just you don't want to find yourself playing a big pot when there are two, well, one one very obviously shallow stack and a bunch of other 30-ish big blind stacks. On this board, I think you just have to check fold. And I, I like the medium two-thirds pot there by the king nine. You have to think that's a board that's going to connect pretty well with the button calling range. It just didn't that time. When reviewing poker hands, it's very important to not be results-oriented. So many people 
care about what happened this one time. Like if you make a bluff and it fails, oh, it must have been bad. Or it was a bad bluff. Or if you um, make a call and it was bad. With the second nuts, it must have been a bad call. It's either good or it's not, right? Based on not the result, but on average. We're playing a game of averages here to some extent. And what happens on average is all that really matters. So in this scenario, Paul's in a neat spot where if he bets, let's say 200k or 250k, he could easily just get shoved on, which would be a disaster because then you probably have to fold. Whereas if he checks and then faces a bet, he can easily rip it in. Check shove all in. He'd also perhaps like to check shove with some flush draws. Also like to check shove with some over pairs. I think that's a pretty reasonable strategy in this spot. Um, if it does go check, check, he can then very easily bet turn plus river. And I think that is somewhat logical and uh, reasonable. So with this ace-10, do you even start betting? I think you probably don't. You probably want to bet with stuff like um, no showdown value hands, like jack-10 of hearts or spades. I suppose it's okay to bet with this, because if you bet and get raised, you can just fold. If you are going to bet, you probably do want to start betting small. I like the small bet, because if you get raised, it's just way cheaper. And if your opponent calls, there are a lot of cards you can continue barreling on the turn. So I think this is pretty reasonable. He does just get called. Interestingly enough, if you face a bigger bet here with the ace-5 of clubs, you probably should at least consider raising. When you face a tiny bet, you should be more inclined to call because you're just getting really good odds. And also, you're now making a quite large shove. Whereas in this scenario, facing a tiny bet, you're just getting great odds to call. And if you do shove, it'll be a very, very big amount, right? I feel like I'm getting confused. It's too early. Check, check, turn. Does ace-high need to bluff river? Probably, probably. Ugh, you sure hate it. But I think the answer is probably. If you have, like, kings here, you would definitely bet. And I think you should probably go a little bit bigger, because you're going to spread if they get hero called. If you go something like 450k, um, ace high is going to fold basically every time. You may even get a hand like pocket fours to fold. I'm sorry, pocket uh, fives to fold. Maybe pocket sevens to fold if you bet kind of big. Notice when Paul goes tiny, though, he does get hero call just purely because of pot odds. Like, I don't even know if ace-10 is a great call in this scenario. It's definitely close. But when you face small bets against people who are good, active, etc., you just have to find calls like this. And it worked. I think in most spots, when your range contains a lot of very strong hands, you usually want to go a pretty big size. Ace, queen of diamonds, min raises. Which is, I'm sorry, ace, queen of, diamonds, queen of diamonds goes all in, not min raises. I think that's fine. When you're the child stack again, you just don't really mind picking up the pots. That said, I think min raising would be fine too. I don't have a problem with that. You could get really fancy and develop a limping strategy, but I think that's probably better for the medium stacks than the short stack. I have a new book that came out recently, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. Let me show you. It'll be released at the end of this, well, it'll be released at the end of August 2020. We have a chapter by Draft Ganger here. See, Draft Ganger and John Van Fleet. There you go. Two, many of the best players in the world. Um, Draft Ganger has a chapter on playing the middle stacks at Final Tables, and he discusses a lot of limping. Funny enough, just this weekend, Draft Ganger and John Van Fleet right next to each other here. Both Final Table, the $10,000 tournament, the Stadium Series, and Vlada right here in the bottom right. Well, that corner. He won the 5K freeze out. Congrats to him. It's very important to surround yourself with the crushers. <laughs> it turns out if you surround yourself with the best players in the world, you, you get elevated. And if you surround yourself with people who complain about bad beats and nonsense all the time, you, uh, well, sink to the bottom. There we saw a fold from the King-9 in the big blind. I think that's fine. Kristen has been pretty active. I mean, look, 28% is what she's playing. That's what this number is here. It's a pretty high number, but I think King-9 is still fine to fold. 
Limp from King Queen, which I think is good. When you're the medium stack, again, you really just don't want to play big pots. And if you raise, it opens the door for you to get three bad, and then you have, may have to jam, and it's pretty gross. I think you'd rather just do this limp call strategy like Patrick does here. Because you really just don't want to go broke. Now, obviously, this allows the bigger stack and the big blind to push you around to some extent, which is always a bummer. But I think that's just fine. You don't really have great options there. And if you do get a king or a queen on the flop, you're just thrilled. So, I have an interesting pot. Let me rewind this a second. I was busy putting a book away. What in the world happened here? Min raise, and then Patrick calls on the button? I don't like that. That seems terrible. Um, you don't want to be calling min raises with a 10-9 offsuit on the button against the early position raiser. And Patrick may about to be punished hard. So interestingly enough, you have to think Beller Mino is going to bet this flop. Patrick's going to call or raise one of the two, and Dong should just fold. Multi-way in scenarios like this, even facing small bets, I know that you're facing a small bet. I think you have to be somewhat inclined to make a really, really nitty fold. You don't like folding in these spots. We have to think, how is this hand likely going to play out? Well, if I face any additional bet on the turn, you like have to fold unless you improve. If you improve, you could still be beat because notice if an eight comes, you could be against jack 10 or a set. If a nine comes, you could be against a better nine like he is here. Like notice right here, he's just in terrible shape. And this is very often what you're going to be looking at in multi-way pots when it goes bet call. Like middle pair and bottom pair should almost certainly be folded. And like, look, I, I can justify him calling with this hand because it is a top pair with a, some backdoor equity. But you have to be very cautious in this scenario. If, this, if, you, if he was facing a larger bet for, let's say, uh, 300K, I think it's a much easier fold. Funny enough, my chapter in that book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games, is, well, one of my chapters, is on multi-way pots. Not specifically at final tables, but multi-way pots in general. And I think a lot of people are just way too loose and splashy thinking that all their outs are live. And they don't recognize that if a lot of money goes into the pot and a multi-way pot, you're really just not loving it. He does go for the raise, though. Wow, okay. I mean, this at least is going to immediately get him clear information. I think it's probably just a call for Bel Bellarmino. Like, he doesn't care if his opponents stay in the pot. I mean, yeah, they could have random draws, but whatever. And if he re-raises, you have to think that they're going to fold out all their marginal bluffs and whatnot. He does go for the re-raise. It goes for the men re-raise, essentially, which is interesting. Maybe that's going to induce a play. The 9-8 does stick around. I think it's probably just a fold for the 9-8 again. Like, right here, I think this 9-8 is being substantially overplayed. And it looks like, unless he drills the river he's going to be in bad shape um i mean i think it's a call on the turn if you've randomly found yourself in this spot are you good 30 percent of the time i mean you probably are obviously there are huge payout implications but to call the flop re-raise you have to presume your opponent's getting after it to begin with so i'm not really sure how the six changes anything too much given you have the eight blocker to block 10 8 and you have open-ended straight draw and backdoor draws just arrived so I'm very surprised at that call of the flop raise and then the fold to the turn bet because you have to see that coming, right? And even then, like, the six is one of the best cards you could get. You just, like, drilled it out of the park to turn open into straight draw. So you know, well, mostly know, worst case, you have 20-ish percent equity, maybe 18 percent equity. Worst case, right? So if worst case you're 18 percent and you only need to be 30, well, probably more like 35 or 40 based on um, ICM implications, and the fact that you called the re-raise on the flop. I mean, all that kind of states that you think the opponent's getting after it and has a loose range. If you think that, you really should not be folding in that scenario, I don't think. It's not a good spot to be in, which is why you don't want to re-raise in the first place. You may think, I'm going to re-raise the flop to get clear information. And, you know, maybe you do. But whenever you get re-raised, I mean, isn't that not the clear information you were hoping for? Obviously, Ballerino with his big stack is incentivized to, to run bluffs, but, I mean, he's really going to be blasting it in scenarios like that? I mean, I don't think so. So, very cautiously played hand by the king-queen. I think that's fine, though. You definitely want to just... Check call flop, check turn, 
and the uh, you could certainly go for value on the river, but the check is definitely the cautious line and probably the right play at a final table again. There are a lot of spots where the right play is the cautious one when you're in medium stack, like Simon and Patrick both were in that spot, but you could certainly value at the river. If you value at the river, you may get raised, though, because Ace Jack got there, and that would clearly be terrible. Raised from Aya Bel Bellarmino, three bets. I think that's great. Ten nine on the button could definitely go either way based on these two players' stack sizes. This is a spot where with like normally ten nine offsuit is a fine raise, but when you have the two well two bigger stacks to your left and you have multiple shallow stacks at the table, I mean notice there's three twenty big blind or shorter stacks here. You just have to fold in Simon's spot with a very obvious middle stack. Those are under Bellarmino. I mean, I'd just be very aggressive. I'd be leaning on these players a ton. I would raise a lot. We haven't heard anything from Jerome so far. I would call the raise with Jack-8, then just fold to a flop bet. It's an amazing flop for the Queen-4. Kind of a bummer he didn't get action. Well, bummer for him. <laughs> not a bummer for the big blind. Normally, you're wanting to hit the flop in some way, but not when your opponent makes two pair. King-9 opens again. So this ace-10 offsuit is another spot where you really don't want to be three-betting because if you three-bet and get called, well, you're going to get called a lot, first off, because the big stack is in position and they can put you in, in nasty spots post-flop. And you'd rather just call, see a flop, and you know keep it keep it cheap until the shallower stacks have busted. Because remember, like let's say the shallow stacks all bust. You move from getting a payout of $40,000 or something to like $100,000, which is substantial, right? You like double your money if you just outlast three people here. So I do think the medium stacks are highly incentivized to be tight against the big stack. And if you just make a pair post-flop, you, you know you're not folding. Okay, ace-5 also likes to call the big blind as well. It could shove if it thinks both players are loose, but you have to think Jerome has something decent. So if Jerome has something decent, you don't want to jam the ace-5 offsuit. And now I imagine Bellarmino may just steal this pot with a flop bet. I think it's probably fine to bet. King high lacks showdown value. You're going to get under pairs like sixes to fold. You have lots of backdoor equity. I, li I like a bet here a lot. Not because it's going to work, of course, but uh, I like it because you have a, a hand that lacks showdown value and you have multiple backdoor draws. And if you get raised, you can easily fold. All right, we're about 30 minutes into this video. So we're going to pause it. Blinds are going up. We'll come back with a new blind level. Um, we, I don't know how many parts this video is going to be. It's going to be a bunch, but, um, we'll review this over the next few weeks. If you enjoy this kind of content, let me know. Thanks again to GG and World Series of Poker for letting me use their content. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments section. I'm happy to check those out and, uh, check out my site, pokercoaching.com. Click like, click subscribe, and I will see all of you next time. Bye-bye.